Beloved by God Church, let us begin our service before the Lord. Let us stand up and confirm the confession of the faith of our heart, the promise that belongs to the door of our hope. May the resurrection of Christ reign within our bodies. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful to your holy name for the great privilege of being in this place that your hand has appointed for the worshiping of your holy name. Now allow your inheritance in the name of the blood of the covenant to be lifted to heights that are not reachable for us and destroy all burden and sin that binds us. May in the service as previously all the works of devil be cursed, illnesses, poverty, untimely death, demonic possession, all matter of fear, depression, destruction, ignorance, and error, all of this may it depart from the tents of your holy people. Now stand, O Lord, upon the place of your rest, you and the ark of your might, and may your saints be clothed into your salvation and rejoice before your face. Give us more of your Spirit, saturate us with your Holy Spirit, allow us to find your great face. We thank you that the service is presented by Apostle Arkadi into your godly hands, and we pray continue to lead it with a mighty and powerful arm, our great God, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May you be blessed. Please be seated. The Book of Hebrews 11, 5 By faith Enoch was taken away that so that he did not see death, and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. To please God. The essence of the testimony, Pastor Arkady writes, that was given to Enoch because Enoch pleased God was his earthly body, which was transformed in the blink of an eye into a heavenly body, the image of which he carried in his heart because of a revelation of the Holy Spirit for a time span of 300 years in the format of a promise of the adoption of his body by the redemption of Christ. Practically, this unique verse, although it belongs to the examples we have of the heroes of faith who are given the faith of God, is one that stands apart from all the other heroes of faith who are mentioned in this chapter so that we can imitate their faith because separate from Enoch this is the testimony that was given regarding all of the rest of all of the heroes of faith these all died in faith not having received the promises but having seen them afar off were assured of them embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth these all died in faith not having received the promises, Hebrews 11.13. But about Enoch, it says he was taken so that he did not see death, and he was not because God had decided to take him. Therefore, in this verse, we see the collaboration of the faith of man with the faith of God, which in the given words is presented in the revelation of a special promise given by God to man, consisting in God's intention of moving a person to heaven, allowing him to bypass the death that expects us all after man has grown his Methuselah in the image of a perfect man who will achieve the age of 300 years. Therefore, in the given verse, the faith of man is presented in such obedience to the faith of God where Enoch was called to conquer death in his body and after that walked before God for 300 years so that he pleased God and in this way received the right to the power to be moved to heaven by passing the death that expects us all. Therefore, it was not the birth of Methuselah, but walking before God for 300 years and at this time growing Methuselah is what pleased God. As we can see again that the purpose was not the birth. It is the means necessary. Enoch needed to bear Methuselah and after bearing Methuselah, he had the opportunity to walk 300 years before God. Enoch was 65 years old and he bore Methuselah and after bearing Methuselah, he began walking before God. 
And so before this, he walked in faith. There's a difference between walking in faith and walking before God. Walking in faith is not always walking before God. But when we're specifically walking before God, then we walk, of course, in faith. According to the revelation of Scripture, moving to heaven, to God, bypassing death that expects us all, is the brightest hope of our trust, concealed from prior generations, and was kept in heaven for those who fear God, who live in these last days. Therefore, this unique promise is called to be revealed by God only within the last times, by the obedience of the faith of man to the faith of God, presented in Scripture in the preached words of the apostles and prophets who are called to be the lips of God. And the promise of this glorious hope is identified in Scripture for those who fear God in the last days as the inheritance that is contained in Christ, incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for those who will be ready to be revealed only in the last time, as it is written, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to to be revealed in the last times. Waiting for the salvation of our body by the adoption of Christ which we need to do so that we can move to heaven and bypass the death that expects us all is the glorious promise called to be fulfilled in the last days at the door of our hope, which is the primary goal of our imperishable and unsearchable inheritance in Jesus Christ. And it is tightly linked with a series of other oath promises of God which we need to be clothed into, otherwise we will not be allowed to move to heaven and bypass the expecting us death, which Enoch was able to overcome. And so as we see here, there are other oath promises. The inheritance is not consistent of one promise, but a series of promises that confirm the truthful nature of one the other, they identify one the other, they reveal themselves in one the other as well. Since all these promises, including the adoption of our body by the redemption of Christ, is an integral part of our inheritance in Jesus Christ. All of these promises, including the adoption of our body, is an integral part of our inheritance. Therefore, it is necessary for us to answer four fundamental questions. Question one, What do we need to do to receive the ability to pay the appropriate price for the right to walk before God so that we can please God and receive a living testimony that we please God? Or how do we need to be? How do we need to be so that we can receive the seed about the kingdom of God in the form of Methuselah to bear him and grow him? How do we need to be? And we saw this in the example of Jairus and he had shown us when we look from the prism of the soul when he showed it in the example of Isaiah and his two sons he had a pastor our our pastor Akadi has shown it to us from the angle or prism of the spirit when the Lord prepares us to receive this imperishable promise that we will be growing and have the ability then to walk before God. Question two, what criteria and characteristics do the scriptures provide for the completeness or fullness of our incorruptible, undefiled, and unfading inheritance in Jesus Christ? What is our incorruptible, undefiled and uh, inheritance. Question three, the price that we need to pay to collaborate our faith with the faith of God so that in this way we can please God. And question four, by what results do we examine ourselves as to whether we are in the faith by the fact that we walk before God? And so we had already studied question one and we will continue to, to study question two. 
what criteria and characteristics do the scriptures provide for the completeness or the fullness of our incorruptible, undefiled, and unfading inheritance in Jesus Christ, which is not given to us in the form of a menu in a restaurant where we can choose something or leave something, considering that for every oath promise which is included in our inheritance and the incorruptible and unfading inheritance that is in Jesus Christ, we need to pay a full price. And so all of the oath promises that Brother Kadi will be showing us here, we can we we can't just uh, choose it as on a menu. We they are they're all a, a component of our inheritance and they all have a required price. And all of these promises they are called to be placed into the spirit, but the wallet is in our soul. The spirit receives the promise and then tells the soul, now go and uh, take care of the, the, the payment, the price. And the soul says, how? With your life. And the soul says, what do you mean? With your nation, the house of your father that's re- that resists the truth, and your personal desires, which you present as God's will, as God's desire. Go and pay this price so that I can receive this promise. And if a person is a student of Jesus Christ, the soul of such a person goes to the cashier and begins to pay the price for every single promise. Since every promise is given to us exclusively in the format of a seed, which we received into a conscience that is cleansed from dead works, or the soil of our heart, which we are called to grow into the fruit of the Spirit. Not understanding the fullness of our reward in the format of our incorruptible and undefiled inheritance, we will not be able to place it into our heart in the form of the faith of God, and consequently we will not have the legitimate ability to walk before God so that we can please God. And so we need to understand, we need to comprehend the essence of this imperishable, unsearchable inheritance so that we can receive it and have the ability then to walk before God so we can please Him. We are studying 12 components of our incorruptible, undefiled, and unfading inheritance, although there are many more of them. And as our pastor has repeatedly said, we all ha- we already have all of this. If you're a holy person and you love Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, you're a servant of Christ, a student of Christ, you have all of this within you, except for one. Except for one, 99%, 99.9%. Only one you don't yet have. Our bodies are still in the state of corruption, state of death, but the rest of the promises, it's already in you. And this does give us joy. This gives us joy and comfort. We see for this that for the sake of this remaining percentage, we are still here and we thank God and we continue to confirm this promise within our life. First component identifying our incorruptible, unfading, and undefiled inheritance in Jesus Christ is the Lord Himself. And so you could say, well, pastor, you don't have to say any more. I'm going to the cashier. I'll pay the price. So this is the first. There's other prices. You need to go a little bit deeper. Uh, Don't go yet. And so our inheritance is God himself, the Lord himself. As it is written, O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The lions have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. And so the Lord is our inheritance, our portion. And so for the Lord to be a part of my inheritance, I need to be a part of the Lord. The Lord can't be a part of mine if I am not part of His. And so the script, the scripture pastor says, how can we determine what characteristics identify the fact that we are his portion or his lot so that we can then have the Lord be ours. And so the Lord asks, are you my son? Are you my daughter? Yes, your daughter, your son. 
And how do you how does he check this? Can you receive grace for grace? Can you say, forgive me as I have forgiven those who have trespassed against me? Can you show reverence before me so I can uh, show demonstrate my favor toward you? That means we are then his portion because we collaborate with his grace upon his conditions. We are clothed into the mantle of a student and we discipline our ourselves with the spiritual thoughts. We make the decision not to sin upon the level of our spirit. We still are able to fall and sin upon the level of our soul, but not our we are not able to sin upon the level of our spirit. We will not allow some kind of evil thought in some way to intercept our spirit. We are born from God and we will never allow any evil thought, corrupt thought, to intercept our heart. There are things we cannot spit on. God, the blood of Christ, the truth of Christ, the Holy Spirit, this is the church of God. These are people whom God has sent. These five, and we be, if we begin to spit upon what is God's or holy to God, then we allow the devil, of course, then uh, to take his place, and we then will sin upon the level of our spirit. And so the way we react, our relationship with all of these five, will determine our relationship with God. And so we've made the decision, again, not to sin upon the level of our spirit. And we need to understand that all of us have been tested and will still be tested, of course. Like a new virus will appears and you still need to vaccinate yourself. And, and this way you prepare yourself for your eternity. Not a single person will go into eternity who has not yet been vaccinated from the first uh, from the first sin like the devil uh, and so when the winds come and when you begin to see uh, the spinning in the direction of what is sacred to God the Lord will see and look at whether we're doing this and if we refuse to do this and we don't join with these wicked and unclean who do these things that that do this kind of stuff, then we, in this way, tell the Lord that we have vaccinated ourselves from this first sin. And if in heaven someone does this to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I will be on your side and I will not join these people. For example, a person goes into eternity and he... Uh, was not vaccinated against it, they will go directly to hell. When people spat upon the truth, what did what did you do in that moment? And unfortunately with some people it's it's not the result that we would like. And so we again don't need to we need to not sin upon the level of our spirit and be vaccinated. We need to also search for our heavenly home. <clears throat> we search for our heavenly home. We search for the city whose builder and maker is God. We have a humble and contrite spirit that trembles before God's word. We have separated with our soul and also with those, the, all those things that are connected to, to, the, to the flesh and carnal things. And so in this way, we demonstrate that, Lord, I am your portion, and then the Lord can say, then I am yours as well. I am a part, then, of your inheritance. You are a part of my inheritance, my portion. Second component, identifying our incorruptible, unfading, and undefiled inheritance in Christ Jesus is the guide that brings us to Christ in the format of the Law of Moses containing the shadows and symbols in which we see concealed the commands of the Lord Jesus Christ in the form of the teaching of Christ. Deuteronomy 33, 4, 5. Moses commanded a law for us, a heritage of the congregation of Jacob, and he was king in Jeshurun when the leaders of the people were gathered, all the tribes of Israel together. <clears throat> Moses commanded a law for us, a heritage of the congregation of Jacob. 
<clears throat> the law of Moses is a component, a part of the imperishable inheritance, the heritage for the congregation of Jacob. What is the congregation of Jacob? This is someone who belongs to Jacob, and to belong to Jacob, it's not enough just to be a Jew in the flesh. It's it's not enough. A true Jew in the flesh, or a, a true, a, rather in the spirit, a true Jew in spirit is one who's walked through the narrow gate, through the pearly gates. When you when in scripture it's written, I saw Jerusalem and it had great and high walls and twelve gates, and upon the gates were written the twelve names of the sons of Israel, the names of the twelve sons of Jacob. And now the Lord says, if we will be able to pass through these through these twelve gates, that's pass through the narrow gate, and be, that means become uh, this narrow gate, take on their form. This is a true Jew. Uh, this is one who has passed through Christ, through the narrow gate. He has a true partaking to the congregation of Jacob. And so you don't need to have a Jewish last name or uh, or that you are familiar with someone who is, that's, that's not going to do it. We see that Jerusalem, it has this, uh, if we walk through this narrow, this pearly gates, uh, that has the 12 uh, names of the patriarchs, then we will be able and to be able to walk through them. We need to have the first uh, 12 apostles in our foundation. When we have laid the foundations, then we raise the walls and then the names are written of the tribes, uh, the names of the of the patriarchs of the tribes of Israel. And so the congregation of Jacob are those who have passed through the narrow gates and those who have passed through the narrow gates. Only such people, for such people, does the law of Moses become an imperishable inheritance. Imperishable inheritance only for the one who has died by the law for the law. If a person has not passed through the narrow gate, has not died by the law for the law, then, or to that law, then then the law of Moses will not be his friend because the law of Moses is called to uh, kill. depends on which hands you're in. For the saints, the law of Moses consists of two things. He is a guide that leads us to Christ. That's the first thing. And when we receive the work of the redemption of Jesus Christ, we receive then the Lord. We receive his work. We receive your, your blood, Jesus Christ, and this makes me righteous and holy, not my fasting or prayers or sermons or good work. Your blood, my sinner, me, me as a sinner, your blood uh, uh, has cleansed me and I receive justification. I receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Master of my life. And so the law of Moses, Moses has done what? He has discovered the sin in me, has guided me to Christ. I've taken Christ by the hand and right before my eyes then... And so then he uh, takes the cross and passes it on to me. And I then will use this cross to kill my enemy, that is the old man. But when a person does not want to receive the law of Moses as an imperishable inheritance, that's to receive it as a guide to Christ and as one who will carry my armor or my weaponry so I can use it to kill the enemy, then for such a person, the law of Moses will be just a, uh, as an overseer and a judge and one and one then that will imp, uh, implement the, the law against you. And they will be then, unfortunately, the perishable promise and not the imperishable. He is one who... who who oversees and ensures that order uh, takes place. And so if if we want the law of Moses to be an imperishable inheritance for us, we need to agree that, Lord, I receive your law, as Pastor has written here. The law needs to be a guide to Christ, and then he transforms into the, uh, our, the bearer of arms, or my bearer of arms, who will be able to, the, the weaponry I will be able to use to, uh, fight against hell and death. And so, in whose hand uh, the law of Moses is will determine what he is for them. 
for example, the sword of Goliath, when it was in the hand of hands of Goliath, it was killing the inheritance of God. But when it was in the hands of David, what did he do? He killed Goliath with it. And so the law of Moses or death, it de- depending on in whose hand it's in. If it if it's if the law of Moses in the is in the hand of the old man, then the law death is then the uh, product of sin in our life. And so because uh, for the for the sin or the committed sin, the verdict is death. You committed the sin, you need to die. Jesus dies upon Golgotha and changes the status of death and now says that death is not the result of sin, but death is the weapon or tool against sin. And when David understood this, took these five uh, smooth stones and uh, hit Goliath, struck him in the forehead. And when he struck Goli- uh, Goliath, he took the law of Moses, took it in his hand, this sword, this sword of Goliath he relied upon, and he chopped off his head with it. And you remember when he went to Abimelech and asked him, <clears throat> Do you know? Do you have breads for my people? And he said, No, except for the uh, uh, breads uh, that are on the table of showbreads. And you're not, but you're not a prophet or a priest. <clears throat> and he gave it to him, and he he did eat it. And he asked, Do you have any weapons? And he said, I have one, but uh, it's the sword of Goliath, the one that you had killed. And so. He told him, remember, there's the one weapon that you have and you're in the temple of your body and with it you killed Goliath. There's none like it. You have the weapon, the law of Moses, and this law of Moses, the descendants of uh, of Jacob, uh, these uh, this uh, death is not the result of sin, but it is a weapon now to to use against sin or to chop up the head of Goliath. And so in the second component, Pastor has said, I never expected this. I never saw how that the law of Moses would be a, a component of our imperishable inheritance, but it turns out that he's a, it is a part of it. And so as a revelation of the Holy Spirit, it was revealed to us in this second component. Uh, it is a guide to Jesus Christ third component identifying our incorruptible, unfading, and undefiled inheritance in Jesus Christ is the land of promise in the form of the glorious promise of the adoption of our earthly body by the redemption of Christ. Deuteronomy 1.8 See, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them and their descendants after them. And the key word here is go in and possess, possess the land. That is, the kingdom of God is spoken, it's preached about, and each one goes in with effort. And so go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. Fourth component identifying our incorruptible, unfading, and undefiled inheritance in Jesus Christ is the chosen by God remnant in the form of the body of Christ in the form of our local church. Esther 10.12 So God remembered his people and justified his inheritance. The Lord calls his inheritance his chosen remnant and one of the illustrations that Apostle Arkady had brought forth were the Gibbonites. The Gibbonites were um, when the Israelite people came to the land of Canaan, there were people that were supposed to be destroyed before the face of God, but they had uh, tricked the Israelite people they came to the Israelites and told them, we came from a very far land. Look at our clothes, clothing. Look at our, uh, look at our food. It's, uh, it's moldy. We came from a very far place. Uh, and they said, You're not, are you not deceiving us? They said, no. Can we make a contract with the name of your God that does these great miracles? And they said, yes. And they made a contract with them. And then they found out that these were actually the next city 
that they were supposed to destroy. And we find out that the kings of Canaan became very angry that these Gibeonites betrayed them. And they wanted to destroy them. And Joshua said, uh, fight them, destroy them. And the moon and the stars and the the sun, uh, everything stopped until the Lord was able to avenge. And so if the Lord needs to uh, stop something before rapture, whatever it may be, he will do so. This is uh, very satisfying how uh, the saints, the children of God, are able to avenge themselves. Uh, and so these Gibbonites, although it was a trick, uh, they uh, made an agreement with the people of Israel and they w- then served in the temple. They chopped the wood and they brought <clears throat> this wood into uh, brought this wood into the temple. They did the hard work and they did uh, was what was the work of the Levites technically and so Saul wanted to destroy the Gibeonites completely in his zeal and he began to destroy them and we see that there was a famine that, that had hit them and David had pleaded with God and God said uh, pleaded with God why do we have this famine and God said this was not for sin. This was for the bloodthirsty house of Saul. He wanted to destroy the people that were a part of my chosen people. I had cho- they were the part of the chosen remnant. And he and David called the Gibeonites and asked uh, the Gibeonites, "What shall we do for you so that God can bless Israel?" And they said, "You know, we don't need gold or silver from the house of Saul. We don't want anyone else in Israel to get hurt." We want seven people of his household, and we will hang them. And David says, we, I will give them to you. And they hung the de- seven descendants of Saul. And we see that God's wrath then uh, was quenched, and he gave his water. He gave rain. And so we need to have the right relationship with, with the Church of Christ. Fifth component, identifying our incorruptible, unfading, and undefiled inheritance of Jesus Christ is the heritage of the Gentile nations. Psalm 111, 6, He has declared to His people the power of His works in giving them the heritage of the nations. <clears throat> As we can see, there's a difference between Him giving the land of Canaan as an inheritance is talking about the, the inheritance of the Gentiles, the heritage of the nations, that give us authority over our members so we no longer be slaves of of sin and lawlessness, but that we give our members as slaves of righteousness. This is the heritage of the nations. The members of our body, they began to serve. Uh, The Lord made it that you you give the members of your body uh, and they will serve now righteousness rather than lawlessness. Sixth component identifying our incorruptible, unfading, and undefiled inheritance in Jesus Christ is the unique heritage belonging to those who fear the name of God. Psalm 61, 4, 5. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. And it was explained to us that those who fear the Lord, this is the book of remembrance that is being written before his face, and the Lord is writing into this book every day. This is our relationship with one another in the church. This is uh, when we are offended or or, or someone offends us or, or... hurts us but we are forgiving these people and nobody else sees these things but the Lord Lord is writing it in the book of remembrance and so this is very important this relationship of the saints with one another in the church or if someone would could have said something against someone else could have screamed at someone else said something negative towards someone else but withheld their tongue didn't do these things and disciplined themselves the Lord is almighty, yes, but pay attention that when there was a conflict or an argument, one withheld their tongue, did not scream at the other. 
uh, the Lord sees these things. And so before screaming at someone or speaking negative uh, things toward them or calling them names, maybe it's better to take a different road and this very thing will be written into the book of remembrance. And so good work, of course, needs to, or good deeds need to be uh, reasonable and wise. When it's talking about virtue and virtue, knowledge and knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, as we know on all of these, it all begins with virtue. And so in our knowledge, we also need to have restraint or with uh, being able to withhold ourselves. Or for example, if a, a gentleman shakes a woman's hand, but he does it so harshly and then uh, he harms her hand because she has either rings on her hand uh, without really realizing uh, what's, what's going on. In this case, obviously, maybe don't be shaking the hand of this person. Just greet them uh, without shaking the hands of this person. And so kindness needs to be also reasonable. If, if things occur, obviously, you need to find reasonable ways of different ways of maybe doing things. And, of course, if there's true problems or real problems that are occurring, you should, of, of course, go to the helper or pastor uh, to be able to see what's uh, if that could be resolved. And so when we uh, do good work or a good good deed, it needs to be reasonable, it needs to be wise, it needs to be with restraint. You don't need to just shake absolutely everybody's hand and think that this is a good deed that I'm doing. You need to be reasonable about that as well. Seventh component of our imperishable and unsearchable inheritance in Jesus Christ is the revelation of the Holy Spirit revealing to us the mystery of the truth in the heart. Psalm 119, 111 through 113. Your testimonies I've taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever to the very end. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. The inheritance in the form of the revelation of the Holy Spirit in the form of the Urim can only find its harbor in a heart that is built into a temple of the Lord, whose golden table always has fresh unleavened breads in the form of the Thummim. We're talking about how the revelations of God become our inheritance. You see how Pastor uh, shows this allegory so that the revelation of God can become our inheritance. We need to build ourselves into a temple of God, and in our temple, we need to have a table, this golden table of showbreads, upon which these revelations will then lay. If we have not built ourselves into a temple, then of course there will not be revelations there because the revelations cannot then be our inheritance. The result of the fact that we have received the revelation of the Holy Spirit into our heart is the wisdom to comprehend the truth which we previously placed into our heart, even though we did not understand it at the time. Psalm 51, 6, Behold, you, die as it, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. The result of the fact that we received the revelation of the Holy Spirit into our heart or that the showbreads are upon this table of showbreads, it is demonstrated in wisdom to comprehend the truth. If you build yourself into a spiritual house, holy priesthood, and we have the table of showbreads and the breads are on it, this is easily checked or examined. We will understand the truth. First, wisdom demonstrated in our heart is the result of the fact that we received the Holy Spirit as the spirit of adoption. And second, is the result of the fact that we are led by the Holy Spirit, who testifies together with our spirit that we are the children of God, having the status of heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. You see how Pastor shows us that if we have the revelation uh, upon the table of showbreads, then that means we will demonstrate wisdom, the ability to understand the truth, and how do we examine the fact that we have the wisdom to understand the truth? This is by the fact that we receive the Holy Spirit as the spirit of adoption, and that He, together with our spirit, testifies 
and that were led by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 14 through 17. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For we did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. <clears throat> and what does it mean to be led by the Holy Spirit? This is a strong thirst to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit in the preached words of the messengers of God and walk in the direction of the heard by us word. A very interesting seventh component. How do you determine that the revelations of God is a portion or part of my inheritance? This is determined by us building ourselves into a temple of God, and a temple of God will always have this table of showbreads, and the revelations, these breads will be there. And how do we know they're there? We'll have the ability to understand the truth. And how do I determine that I understand the truth? I will receive the Holy Spirit as the Lord and Master of my life and will be led by the Holy Spirit. And how do you determine that you're led by the Holy Spirit? I'll have a great thirst to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit in the preached word of the messenger and follow, walk in the direction of what is heard. And all of this says that... <clears throat> Lord, I received your revelations as my imperishable inheritance. Eighth component of our imperishable and unsearchable inheritance in Jesus Christ is the fruit of our womb in the form of the fruit of our spirit, grown by us from the seed of the preached to us word of truth. Psalm 127, 3 through 5. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. The fruit of our womb which is a part of our imperishable inheritance and so the fruit of our womb is to be perceived as the image of the spirit of uh, image of the fruit of our spirit which is a part of our imperishable and unsearchable inheritance called to stand guard at our gates or the gates of our mouth and so the fruit of our spirit and so not our spirit itself but when our spirit will bear these sons these children and to be able to bear them he needs to become mature, of course, not be an infant spiritually, but already be grown into full measure of growth in Christ. We are fertilized with the seeds of the word of truth so that we can be born from the truth. And so a person who is born from the truth, his spirit will then obtain the state of not just uh, having the, the seeds, but the seeds of the kingdom of heaven. And when this happens, then this fruit of our spirit, the sons of our spirit, the fruit of our spirit, these are the imperishable inheritance. And so let's see here how the fruit of our spirit is in our quiver. The symbol of the quiver where we can place arrows in the form of the fruit of our spirit is to be perceived as a pure heart cleansed from dead works. And so our heart is a quiver where arrows are placed and what kind of quiver a cleansed heart from uh, from dead works <clears throat> where a person does not just justify himself with his own deeds or his own righteousness but receives the deeds of Jesus Christ himself the image of the arrow of the arrows in the quiver is to be perceived as the fruit of our spirit that is grown by us from the seed of the kingdom of heaven received by us by the preached word of the person whom God has made his lips and clothed into his delegated fathership. The fruit of the Spirit, grown by us from the seed of the word of truth, is our mutual collaboration with the truth in the heart and the Holy Spirit, revealing the truth in the heart by the preached word of his messengers. This is specifically why David prayed, as he prays in Psalm 141. The fruit of our spirit, grown by us from the seed of the word of truth, is 
<clears throat> our mutual collaboration. As it says, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men who work iniquity, and do not let me eat of their delicacies. Psalm 141, 3 through 4. The result of such a prayer were the children or young sons in the form of the of the fruit of the Spirit, demonstrated in the confessions of his gentle mouth, disciplined by the truth dissolved by his heart. If we will not confess the truth of the heart about who God is to us in Jesus Christ and what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, we will not be able to fill our quiver with arrows, which is in the form of young sons or children who will stand guard of our lips. Confessing the faith of God consisting within our heart is in fact part of our imperishable and unsearchable inheritance in Jesus Christ in the form of the children or young sons standing guard at the door of our lips so that our lips do not accidentally or unintentionally state any kind of unclean and carnal thought and desire. And so what is this imperishable inheritance, the confession of the faith of heart that is within our heart? Because while we have not yet stated our thoughts and desires in words, they will continue to remain our slaves. But as soon as we state them in words, they immediately get clothed into the status of our masters. And we need to remember, Pastor Kadi writes, it is easier to handle your slaves than it is to handle your masters. And so while we have not expressed in words our thoughts, there are servants, but as soon as we have, have expressed our thoughts in words, our thoughts now have become our masters. Pastor says, uh, talking, he's talking about negative and positive, positive confessions. Our imperishable inheritance is in confession, but what kind of confession? the confession of the faith of God that is contained in our heart, in the quiver of our heart. And he's showing us very different errors as well. And these are errors that actually don't strike the enemy but strike ourselves when we begin to demonstrate our our thoughts that are in our mind with our, with our mouth. Uh, they These errors strike us. Therefore, we need to consider that, that beside our carnal thoughts and desires, predatory birds will also be infiltrating or permeating our mind, which we did not author or produce, although they will insist that it is you who are the author or producer of these thoughts. And if you speak them, then you will immediately turn, <clears throat> then they will immediately turn from predatory birds hovering over your head into criminals who will harm you and inflict heavy wounds upon you. Predatory birds are often prophetic dreams, which in essence are not revelations, but divination. And as soon as you accept them, you open the way for demons of deception into your essence. Apostle Arkady says, may God give you wisdom to never tell either bad or good in your opinion dreams, not about yourself or about others, because God will never reveal to you the problems that are within other people, because for this purpose God has his apostles and prophets. Never attempt to try on their responsibility, because this is great wickedness in the eyes of the Lord. This is the very interesting eighth component that we need to stand guard of our lips and only confess the faith of our heart. The scriptures say that you have made me a sharpened arrow. Why is the Lord working with our heart? Why is he placing this truth into our heart? Why is he training us and telling us not to demonstrate your thoughts? If you have a dream, and someone comes to you and says, I have a dream. Do you want me to tell you the dream? You say no. And in this way, you allow God's faith to to dominate and that we have the sure, the, the true word confirmed in God's messenger or, or God's apostle in my life. And so I cannot accept these divinations uh, that, that this person has seen in his, in his dreams. 
because people sometimes claim that God is revealing that it is God that's revealing these things to this person about you in their dreams. <clears throat> And so if, say, for example, there is a, a, a problem within a person, God will work with the pastor to be able to help this person in a very careful way and not in this, this method or in this format as, as people claim that they receive. And so we, again, need to stand guard of the lips of our lips, of our mouth, and not just express with our mouth whatever thought comes into our mind. <clears throat> ninth component of our imperishable and unsearchable inheritance in Jesus Christ is the ability that is given by God to our tongue to condemn any tongue that rises against us in judgment. Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. And so the, this ninth component is very similar to the eighth. <clears throat> and so we will see some of the similarities in it as well. According to the meaning of the component of the given inheritance, rising against you in judgment will consist in both the inner enemy in the form of the carnal thoughts coming from the entrails of our old man with his deeds as well as enemies outside of us in the form of words of carnal people who are unable to understand or accept the truth will be challenging or disputing our justification which we have received freely by faith in jesus christ trying to turn our eyes not upon what god has done for us in jesus christ but upon what we, according to their opinion, need to do to justify ourselves before God, when within the plan of our of evangelism, good work or good works that come from the flesh, our victory will consist in the fact that our enemies will attempt, with their good works coming from the flesh, to receive justification. At the same time, we will be opposing them by what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, in the plan of our justification, due to which we receive the opportunity to perform righteousness, as it is written, Revelations 22, 11 through 12. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He, he who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. We need to conclude, as Pastor says, that wh however much a person may that he, however much a person may do what is, in his opinion, good work, so that he can justify himself before God, God will still consider him wicked because he replaces God's deeds or God's works with his own, and all of his good work will be then considered unrighteous and bad. At the same time, the work of a righteous person who, in his time, <clears throat> received justification freely by faith in Jesus Christ, and doing so bore his methicella, his deeds will be considered righteous by God, because it is not possible to perform righteousness when you are wicked and replacing the works of God with your own works. Considering this, we will remember that all negative thoughts that visit us are our servants or our slaves, and to rule over us to our destruction, they need to be confessed with our tongue, so that they can govern over us by the means of our words to our destruction. Therefore, never reveal evil. <clears throat> never, therefore, never reveal evil and unclean thoughts in words to anyone under any circumstance, since that would then give these thoughts power to rule over us to our own destruction, especially considering that many thoughts that visit us are not at all of our making, but come to you to us from hell, which the old man represents, living within our body, whom you have genetically inherited in the sinful seed of our fathers in the flesh, who in the form of spirits of deception will attempt to convince you that these thoughts are yours and are of your making. We more than once have ta talked about the fact that unclean thoughts are in the likeness of unclean birds who hover over your altar to defile your offering. <clears throat> Drive them away as Abraham did. You are not able to forbid the unclean birds from flying over your head, but you are able to for forbid them from weaving a nest in your head. 
if you allow Jesus to rest in your head by the means of spiritual thoughts. Spiritual thoughts consisting in who you are in Jesus Christ and what God has done for you in Jesus Christ is the one and only and crushing method of not of not allowing wicked thoughts to weave a nest in your head. However, good thoughts that we received by listening to the preached to us seed of the word of truth, you need to immediately confess so that they, as your children or young sons, can guard the gate of your mouth from confessing evil thoughts. <clears throat> And so again, and so good thoughts that we receive by listening to the preached uh, word or the seed of the word of truth need to immediately be confessed so that they, as our children or our young sons, can guard the gate of our mouth from confessing evil thoughts. Today, there are many leaders, Apostle Arkady writes, who do not understand this truth and call saints to confess unclean thoughts. not just confess sins they've done but a person receives the thought people sometimes uh, these people uh, sometimes uh, insist on on the members confessing all the thoughts they have as well and so in this way they behave as the criminals or as or as we know, the thieves that were in the path from Jerusalem to Jericho and rob and kill all those striving to receive justification in Jericho, the city of palm trees. Run as quickly as you can and as far as you can away from such leaders and unfortunate teachers. Never reveal your thoughts before them that can disturb you and condemn you. Remember, Pastor Arkady writes, God does not input this as a sin to you unless you say or state these thoughts in the fruit of your lips. And so when a person has confessed his thoughts, it is now inputted as a sin. And so the reason uh, it's then input as a sin because this person will then commit that sin because he's proclaimed it. He's he, you've, you've programmed it, and as it, you have now uh, activated this program, um, it's active in your life. Remember, God. We're reading again. Remember, God does not input this as a sin to you unless you say or state it with your mouth, with your lips. And so when you confess him in the fruit of your lips, that means that it it now um, is in my mind or my and my heart, and a person just needs to commit the sin now. And so what do you do? You need to proclaim your justification, which you have received freely by grace, by faith in Jesus Christ, and glorify and thank God for this unique gift of grace. And then every tongue attempting to attempting to condemn you will experience a crushing or devastating defeat. And so what have we seen here in this ninth component that is very similar to the eighth component? It is necessary for us to drive away evil thoughts and we need to have good thoughts that that is confess only the good thoughts, the truth that we hear and not confess evil thoughts so that they not become our master. Tenth component of our imperishable and unsearchable inheritance that is in Jesus Christ is the heritage of Jacob. I say 58, 13, 14. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him not doing your own ways, not finding your own pleasure, not speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The heritage of Jacob is on the high hills of the earth. 
This is the image of the oath promises of God. And to receive a portion of this imperishable and unsearchable inheritance is directly connected to our relationship with the Sabbath, which symbolizes our church. And so these high hills of the earth, I shall delight, you shall delight yourself in the Lord. I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth. If you have the proper relationship with the Sabbath, And so it says, if you turn, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on that holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, all of these things that are written here about this. Let's read about the results that that can come from one who does not honor the Sabbath. Hebrews ten twenty five through twenty nine. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but extorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a cer- certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. How does it begin? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. We need to finally understand, Pastor Pastor Arkady writes, that abandoning your church is equivalent to not honoring what is holy, consisting in the blood of the covenant and insulting the Holy Spirit, which in the given place of Scripture is compared to blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. The Scriptures say that any sin a person repents in will be forgiven, but how the insulting of the Holy Spirit, which in this place of Scripture is equivalent to blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, will not be forgiven in this age or the age to come. Matthew twelve thirty through 32 He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad, Therefore I say to you, every sin and and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. Therefore the heritage of Jacob that is on the high hills of the earth in the form of the oath promises of God belong exclusively to those saints who do not insult the Holy Spirit with their unrighteous behavior toward the church and are led by the Holy Spirit or make the decision to be led by the Holy Spirit. And so as we read, uh, when you blaspheme against the church or or your relationship with with the church is as such, uh, then it's as you are blaspheming also the Holy Spirit. If you're blaspheming the church, you're blaspheming in the Holy Spirit. And so someone will ask, well, so can we then insult Jesus Christ and insult God? Uh, is it just the Holy Spirit we need to speak uh, that we not insult? It's just the Holy Spirit that we not insult And so this was a woman who had asked this question because uh, her family member, she was very afraid that when he's drunk, he says a lot of things that he shouldn't say. And she was terribly afraid that he will insult the Holy Spirit. And so to insult the Holy Spirit or blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, uh, you need to determine who it is who can blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. An unchristian person cannot blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. It's someone who knew God very closely, who became uh, a partaker of the Holy Spirit. To blaspheme against the Holy Spirit is to blaspheme the Son of God or to insult the Son of God. If you speak anything against the Son of Man, it says it will be forgiven. But if you speak...
And so one who speaks evil against the Son of Man can be done by someone who's not close to God, but one who can speak uh, evil against the Son of God is one only that already was close to God. And you can't call Jesus as the Son of God, but only by the Holy Spirit. And again, only a person who was close to the Lord, that was close to Jesus Christ, is able then to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit and insult then the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and so unchristian uncle- people who do not know God, uh, they are not able to insult the Holy Spirit. They can insult the Son of Man, but they don't know uh, the Holy Spirit, and they they don't know Jesus as God. Only one who knew him knows him closely uh, is one again who will be able, who can actually uh, speak evil against him. So now, brethren, I command you <clears throat> to God and to the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And so as it is written, they were enlightened by the truth. They uh, tasted of the heavenly gift. They uh, were within the word of God. They they knew the things that are to come. They received their calling, and then they fell away. And what does it mean that they fell away? And so the righteous, they will fall seven times and rise again. But the wicked, they will fall and not rise. The, the wicked falls one time. He falls away from the body of Christ. And so blasphemy against the Holy Spirit can only be done by one who knew him, knew the Holy Spirit, who was previously holy and then became wicked to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit or God or the Son of God is one, again, who was a part of the Lord Jesus Christ and then decided to become his enemy. And that again, the, the blasphemy against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Son of God is the, that blasphemy will not be forgiven. These are people who rejoiced about the truth, who grew in the truth, who knew the truth, and then decided to fall away, become enemies of God, and insulted insulted God in doing so. And so the Lord, when he reveals his beauty, his his mysteries to a person, he doesn't do this just so that a person can turn around and spit in the Lord's face. The nation that crucified Christ, they crucified the Son of Man, but the leaders, the elite, the leaders within the nation, they were crucifying the Son of God. Because those that were just within the, 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 the people that were uh, realized what they had done. They were repenting and they felt guilty for what they did. But those that were the, the, the leaders of the nation did know and uh, knew that they were crucifying the Son of God. And so when a person rises against God's order, against the truth, against the person whom God has sent, th- th- and this person spits, uh, this person a spits against the messenger of God or upon the messenger of God, then uh, this is this is insulting the Son of God. And the Holy Spirit doesn't reveal the truth to us so that we can then turn around and trample upon it. Because this person has already transformed himself into the devil at this point. This was the interesting 10th component. 11th component, identifying our imperishable and unsearchable inheritance in Jesus Christ is eternal life with all that comes with it or inheritance with all the sanctified. In Acts 20, 32, so now brethren, I command you, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, 
which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. To give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The sanctified are people who are separated or separate themselves from their nation, from the house of their father, and from their life in the flesh. To serve God, the life in the flesh always places its hope upon earthly wealth. Therefore, to separate yourself from your life in the flesh is to separate yourself from trusting in earthly wealth. Otherwise, the ability to inherit the the inheritance with all the sanctified in the form of eternal life will be impossible. This is well evident in one of the dialogues of Christ and a certain individual whom Christ loved, but who became saddened by the response of Christ to the question posed by this person. Matthew 10:17 through 24 Now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one, no one is good but, but one, that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. But he was sad at the word, and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard is it for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God? Hope and dependence upon earthly wealth is unfitting with the desire to inherit eternal life in the form of the kingdom of heaven. Because what is our hope in the form of earthly wealth, which we placed ourselves in dependence of, is then our worship and our God. This was the interesting 11th component. What we place ourselves in dependence of is our worship and is our God. Don't place yourself in dependence upon perishable wealth. As it says in Scripture, did God not choose the poor of the world? During one of the sermons of tithes, Our pastor had shown who the poor of the world are. The poor of the world can be uh, people who are very wealthy financially, but absolutely don't depend on finances. They serve the Lord with the finances. And also there are people who physically are very poor, don't have much, but absolutely depend upon physical wealth. These are people who are not the poor of the world. The poor of the world are not, det- this does not determine how much you have. David had millions. Abraham also was very wealthy. All, all the authors, they were very, very wealthy people. Prophets were wealthy. Kings uh, gave them thrones, uh, gave them wealth and even bowed before them. They were ministers there. They had wealth, but it, it wasn't how much was in their pocket, but how you or what you depend upon, whether you depend upon what is perishable or imperishable, to receive the inheritance with all the sanctified. These are those who do not depend on perishable wealth. And the twelfth component of our imperishable and unsearchable inheritance in Jesus Christ is the promise consisting in the image of our imperishable body into which we are being clothed before we are raptured upon the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. 1 Corinthians 15, 47 through 50. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as in 
in the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. The time of the fulfillment of this promise will happen at the sound of the last trumpet. However, if this promise that is included in our imperishable and unsearchable inheritance will not be grown by us from the seed placed into our pure heart in the format of fruit, we will lose it. 1 Corinthians 15:51 through 55 Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Apostle Paul shocked people when he said these words. I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, meaning we shall not all die. But we shall all be changed. I tell you a mystery, he says. I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that's we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? This mystery has now become the possession of our heart. Yes, Apostle Paul said, Friends, I, from our Lord Jesus Christ, received this truth that not all of us will die. We will be taken just as Enoch, as Elijah was taken. The Lord will take his chosen remnant from the earth and when we approach the door of hope and as we have approached it now this promise will 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 happen at the door of hope before the Lord takes his people from the earth he will come and be glorified within the saints and then I will come and take this glorified church we have These witnesses, we have Enoch, we have Elijah, we have Moses and Christ, these four people that today are in heaven and have the new glorified bodies. Elijah and Enoch are people who did not see death and were taken to God. Moses and Christ, these are those who died, resurrected, and then were taken to God. And so we have four witnesses. And so also those who at the door of hope will put on the new bodies and those who had died also, they died, they will, they will resurrect and also be renewed. And so if we d- die with the promise, then we will be r- definitely be resurrected and we will be taken to heaven. But if we don't die until this t- by this time, of course, then we will be uh, raptured. And so let us now pray and thank God for the word we were able to hear today. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for the great privilege of being upon this holy place where there's a remembrance of your holy name. We thank you that upon this place is the fear of the Lord. This is where the ladder of the Lord is that touches heaven. And your revelations come down. They descend upon this ladder And they rise our prayers to you and ascend to you upon this ladder. We thank you that with your preached word, you have reminded us of our imperishable inheritance that is in heaven for us. We thank you that a part of this inheritance has already been taken by us. It's a part of it is already our imperishable inheritance and 
in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for the inheritance that has already become a part of our, of a uh, part of us, and so we know that in these last days, you will reveal for your saints those who keep themselves in their faith, who collaborate their faith with your faith. We thank you that we are a part of your inheritance, and that you are a part of our inheritance. We thank you, Lord, for your word and the law of Moses that is a part of our imperishable inheritance that has revealed sin in us and was a guide to Christ for us so we can receive the work of redemption, the work of redemption of Jesus Christ, which he had He had done. We thank you for the justification that we receive freely by grace. Thank you for the work of the redemption of your son, Jesus Christ. We do not... Uh, state these prayers or do good works to receive justification we do these things because the righteous must perform or do the works of righteousness and we receive this righteousness from you and we thank you that you have given us justification allow us to grow the fruit of righteousness within our hearts glorifying your holy name we thank you Lord that a part of our inheritance is our spirit or the fruit of our spirit, allow us today to confess the faith of our heart. Allow us to be vigilant at the gates and never confess with our lips our unclean, wicked, lawless, sinful thoughts. We pray, Lord, that you give us wisdom to ensure that they are slaves and eliminate them and never turn them into fruits of our mouth so that these negative confessions will not become our masters that will lead us to more corruption and death. And so today we have the great privilege, Lord, of preparing our mind for your word, for your spiritual thoughts that will not allow any other thought to intercept and weave its nest within our heart and within our thoughts. We thank you, Lord, for your mighty word, which we have received into our heart, and we will confess your word, and we will be vigilant at our gates. We thank you, Lord, for your godly order, for your inheritance that you give us together with Jacob. You raise us up to heights that are not reachable for us and will give us the heritage of Jacob. But this is upon the condition that we will honor your Sabbath and call it our joy. <clears throat> we thank you that we call your Sabbath, your church, our joy, the place where there's a remembrance of your holy name. We thank you, Lord, that every time we come to this place, we are submerged into the Sabbath and are the Sabbath. We rejoice with an upright joy before you. And we thank you, Lord, <clears throat> for the inheritance of Jacob that you give us. We thank you, Lord, for your church. We thank you for your messengers. We thank you for the person that you have sent to pass on this truth, this precious truth to us. We accept and we keep this truth and we confess this word with our mouth. We thank you, Lord for this wonderful inheritance. We thank you, Lord, for the mystery that you have revealed at the door of our hope that not all will die, but we will be changed in the blink of an eye (laughs) because the corruptness must put on incorruption and the mortal must put on immortality so that death will be swallowed up by victory. Thank you, Lord, for the victory of your Son. Thank you, Jesus, for your victory, for your death and resurrection. Thank you that your death today is for us armor and weaponry against sin because the law has become for us an imperishable inheritance. And now we take this law, this word, this weapon, and turn it against our enemies that are within our essence, within our body, in the form of the old man. And we pray, Lord, 
that the stronghold of death, that is the old man, and his wicked and unclean thoughts, his lawless thoughts and desires, that they be thrusted out from within our body, and that the stronghold of life and resurrection, that is our new man, would be able to be erected in that place and so that we can be clothed into the new man created in accordance to God in righteousness and holy truth. Thank you, Lord, for your word that we were able to hear today and for your Holy Spirit that greatly reveals for us the meaning of your word. We worship before you, our great God, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us finish with our unchanging manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.